and let's record this and start the cahoots. Any question by anybody? Now, I've got 200 question cahoots. I'm doing one, which is the latest one. And I have another one, which I will post for you because I know repetition, repetition does help you understand. So you could go over the other one also. So let's go ahead and get her going. Give me a second. And here we are. Again, any questions during the cahoots, please don't be afraid or think I'm going to beat you up if you ask me a question or stop me. I don't mind questions. I think that if you have a question, I'm sure somebody else is going to have that question too, okay? I have a question. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Professor Morris. <laughs> some of my students may not know how to get to that link so that's it right there www it is kahoot dot it. it and then you put in the pin number and you could choose whatever name you want to go there some people do crazy names some people put real names good my grandson wants to do it too with me so go to kahoot dot it this is your pin code Let's see if a 11 year old kid knows a lot about pediatrics. How does that sound? <laughs> I am in uh, almost Pensacola. I'm in Niceville, Florida, between Destin and Pensacola. And I'm here waiting for the birth of my third grandson. She was supposed to deliver this weekend. She's already dilated, but nothing yet. So I'll keep waiting. Let's get going. Let's get her started. It's okay. When you get there, you get there. HESI review. This is the last one, and it really works well. One second. What is probably the single most important influence on growth at all stages of development? And my class knows this for sure, because I'll repeat it three times ever I talk about it. And that is nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. If you don't feed the brain, it's not going to grow. It's not going to be cognitively aware. And the child will be delayed because you need nutrition to fuel the brain. Very good, guys. I knew you wouldn't fail me there. How would you initially treat a six-month-old infant diagnosed with GERD, reflux? They're spitting up. They're losing calories. It's important. We need to keep them in there, right? You know, and we're going to use this even on the brand new newborns. Um, and it's rice cereal. Now, rice cereal, we know on a newborn, they're not going to get the benefit from the nutrition. They're going to lose it in their uh, stools, but they're going to keep all the milk down. And that's what we want because that's the nutrition we want them to have. So it's usually a teaspoon per ounce. During assessment on a two-month-old, you notice that the head circumference has increased by two inches. What are you going to do next? I mean, what do you think that could be? So what do you want to look for? Well, it could be hydrocephalus. And we know hydrocephalus, what are we going to see? That big bulgy, that soft spot, that fontanelle will be bulging at rest just sitting there. And we know probably hydrocephalus. And we can anticipate doing ultrasounds in the head and maybe getting a VP shunt put in, right? It'll drain the fluid off if that's what's required. 
Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? Why do we have to know all those fine motor developments and gross motor developments? Why? Well, we know that something's going on when they're not where they should be. If they're at six months old and not rolling completely over, we need to investigate why. Is it nutrition or is it neurological condition, muscular condition? So it is stable developmental periods can identify those delays or those deficits in children. A multi. An infant just received their two month set of immunizations. Discharge teaching should include, you know, there's probably four injections they give. There's a lot because babies are born. They don't have an immune system except what mom's given them. And that's going to wear out. So we need to make sure those really bad diseases are covered with the vaccines. So we know it's going to create something in the body. Might have a low grade fever, absolutely normal. That's the body reacting to what they've given it. So they um, make their own antibodies against it. We're gonna put cool ice packs there because it's hot. It gets you know, a little bit hard. So that cool packs help. And then of course, pedaling the legs, which means putting the knees up and down to the chest. And that helps with moving that medicine around and will help relieve that uh, swelling. The head to tail direction of growth is referred to as what? I mean, just look at the word. And we know that head is cephalic, right? So it has to be cephalocaudal. Um, sequential is the way that you go to find motor skills. You know, you start out with the reflex and go to a voluntary palmer grasp and go to pincer, that's sequence. And proximal distal is we start out here at the midline and then we work out and grasp for objects, okay? Cephalocaudal, head, cephalic. <clears throat> What is the single most important factor when communicating with children? You know, kids can be the hardest patient you have or the easiest. And it all depends on this right here. Because if we don't do this, that child's not going to listen to you. They're going to be afraid. So we need to know where is their level. Just because they're four, are they developmentally there? Some aren't, so we have to consider that. Get on their level, then we can start talking, playing with them, and then we can get almost anything we need to get done, but we have to get on their level first. What two-year-old two-year-old pain assessment tool should the nurse use? We've talked about numeric, black, faces, voucher, some of them. So up to age three or nonverbal is flack, okay? After age three, it goes to faces. And then your book says at age eight, it starts the numeric, okay? A child requires ophthalmic ointment to be applied to the eyes. What teaching should the nurse give this child? What is this about ophthalmic ointment they need to know about? So remember, this is ointment. We put it in the eyes and the eyes is gonna be blurry. And that child is gonna get afraid if we don't tell them. So we definitely will tell them it's gonna be blurry. According to Erickson, school-aged children have a prolonged hospitalization should be offered what? To promote industry. What is industry, right?
So we know that industry is what a child can do well. That's the inferiority is they can't do it and they get frustrated. So we want to give them something to do that we know challenges them, but they can get it done. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? Remember, dehydration in children is extremely dangerous. Well, if you're vomiting, there's no way you can give them anything by mouth because what's going to happen? They're just going to continue to vomit. So rest the stomach, IV fluids, antimedics, and then slowly reintroduce those fluids. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with what? Remember, F, fingers, fine. What do the fingers do? First one. And gross motor is G, get up and go, go, go. That's movement. So fine motor is fingers. What do they do? And what it is, is you take a rattle, you put it in and they grasp it. It's a reflex. And then after that, it becomes voluntary. And then it goes to crude pincer and then a neat pincer when they get those little Cheerios, right? An eight month old infant should be expected to perform which fine motor skills? So we start with reflex, then we go to voluntary, and then we go to, and by the end of one year, they should be able to build a tower with two blocks by one year old. So at eight months, they're able to get that rattle and they're on more of a crew. They sort of like put their hand down and grasp a bunch of them, and then they'll end up going really fine after a while. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at what months? So they triple at 12 months. And if they haven't tripled, they're too much, too little, then an intervention will take place. Because again, if it's too little, they're not getting nutrition. Are they going to be developmentally where they should? You haven't given enough fuel to the body. So that would be something that would be looked at. Orange is testing a two and a half year old toddler should report which finding to the provider. You know, when babies are born, they have a huge head, right? And as they get older, that head should go more into relationship with the body. And we measure it according to the chest circumference. So by actually a year and a half, two years old, you should see them equal to, or we should see the chest more than the head. A mother of a three-month-old infant is concerned because the infant's head is flat on the back. What are you going to tell that mother? I mean, we know everything is back to sleep, right? We know that SIDS, we want to protect it. So tummy time, right? These children's heads are soft and pliable. And that little bit of time that we do it, it's going to round out their heads so they're not going to have these flat backs. A two-month-old with cradle cap. What should the nurse tell the parents to treat? How do you treat it? That little white, crusty stuff. And, you know, you want your little baby to be cute with the hair combed so perfectly. And it's this white, crusty stuff there. So you're going to wash it and then just take with a very soft brush or fine comb, comb it. Now it's not going to come off in one sitting. 
there's other things that say like mineral oil, put it on overnight, you know, get it moist, but basically wash it and just comb it. When it, what information about introducing solid foods to a six month old infant would you offer? Like, how do you do it? We know before that their intestinal tracts are way too immature to be able to tolerate foods. And you'll just see the food in their stool. But at six months, we start giving it to them. And we don't want to put new foods all together because infants do have allergies. And the only way to determine that is if we wait in between. You could see vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, rashes. All of those things would tell you this baby doesn't like that food. And what would you would do is, okay, stop it, try another food and go back and try it again. Same thing happens. That is something you will not feed your baby. According to Kohlberg's pre-conventional pre -conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning, what? Preschooler, ages three to five. Remember, Kohlberg is all about morality, good and bad. And a preschooler just knows that there's good stuff and bad stuff, right? And they even know good stuff, they're gonna get a reward or a praise. And bad stuff, probably gonna go on timeout. So they understand these things. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? Let's say they have to go in for a CAT scan or MRI or, you know, tubes is a big thing. Again, they're three to five. These children understand and they really need to be taught so they're not frightened. They'll know what to expect. So first get on their developmental level, right? So now we know how to explain it. Use a doll, let them touch it, feel the equipment, show on the doll where you're gonna do things and what's gonna happen. And then that child during that day that this procedure is being done is gonna be calmer. They know what's expected. Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what to encourage cooperation? So again, let them play, let them touch. I mean, doing the blood pressure, push the machine for me. Um, all these things you can do make it more fun. And it's sort of like a distraction. So it works well with these kids. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child would be expected to what? The way they think, right? It's cognitive. It's all about understanding. And that's their following simple commands. Abstract terms, that is adolescence. Conservation of matter, that's about the glass, whether it's short and squat or tall and skinny, water in the same glass, it's still the same, even though the shape changes, that school age. And another person's perspective, that again is the end of school age into adolescence. Parents are concerned her eight-month-old child's not developing like her older child. What is normal for eight months? So at eight months, that child should be able to sit alone, unsupported. Um, that is the benchmark, the eight months. That's what you would say. An infant presents with signs of dehydration, hunger, an olive-shaped mess 
in the right upper quadrant, what would you monitor for? What do you think that is? What's the one with that olive shaped mass? And then when you see the olive shaped mass, what do you know the diagnosis is? This is pyloric stenosis. So they eat, 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 and all of a sudden they throw up. And I say it's across the room, aim them to a garbage can because it will go across the room and it is projectile. And they're hungry. They're gonna vomit and be hungry again and again. How would we treat these children? Because they're gonna need an ultrasound to determine, yes, it is a pyloric uh, sphincter problem, it's hypertrophy. So they need surgery. So NPO and put an IV in them because they need the sugar um, to maintain them till they get to surgery. A multi, which would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she's caring for. Well, a lot of this stuff is just like adults, but remember adults and children are different in some ways. So we know that we need to do an apical heart rate, right? And they say less than 90 on infants is what uh, we would hold it for. We know that potassium is important if it's too low, it could cause digitoxicity. And the one thing you may see is just the infants vomiting. And even if the heart rate, the digoxin level are okay, potassium level is okay, um, sometimes it's just the vomiting. And I would hold, call the doctor, and just to be sure. When taking adolescent health history, which is most important? So adolescents don't want to talk in front of their parents. It's just commonplace. They don't want their parents to know what's going on, especially if it gets into like a sexual history um, due to frequent urinary tract infections or whatever. So have the parents leave the room. Now, do you have to tell those parents what that child says? No, you don't. But if it's something that will harm them or others, then we will have to tell the parents. But let the parents leave, open and honest with that adolescent, listen to them, and you'll get a good health history. A multi. A 13-year-old status post umbilical hernia repair is complaining of abdominal swelling, severe pain, and vomiting. What could have caused that? It's probably because, you know, umbilical hernia, they have to take the intestines and push it in, put a mess, and there's manipulation. And that can cause the bowels to stop functioning and become a paralytic ileus. And that abdominal swelling, pain, and vomiting, of course, will tell you. And you can even listen to their bowel sounds, and you probably won't hear anything. And that would be the other thing. Or they're not even passing gas. A four-year-old is reluctant to take medicine. What intervention should the nurse take? How are you going to get them to take it? You know, four-year-old preschoolers, what you're going to do is say, I've got a pill or I've got liquid. Which one do you want? You want to chew it or drink it? If you want to drink it, do you want it in a cup, a syringe, or a spoon? And that's it. Straightforward. Tell them what their choices are, and that will be the choice, okay? You don't come back later. You don't have the parents give it. 
You do not mix it with food or juice, unless it's a little tiny little bit, because what if they don't take it all? How much did they take? And that could be dangerous too. Which concept reinforces the development of a sense of trust for an infant? This is all about Erickson, the theorist. What does Erickson say about trust? So they can predict what's coming and their needs are met. They cry, mommy comes, picks me up, burps me, change me, feed me, whatever it is that they want. So that is a trust versus untrust. That child who just cries, 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 nobody comes. That is the child who is going to, after a while, have this flat affect. They're going to stop crying because nobody comes and does anything for them. And that's that mistrust. A child is NBO, unable to take breast or bottle feedings. What is important to remember? You know, we have diagnoses that you can't feed children. Think about tracheoesophageal atresia, esophageal atresia, or the fistula. So if you have them, it's going to go into their lungs or they're going to aspirate, right? What do we have to remember? We need to remember developmental things. How do they soothe themselves? They suck, right? It's a self-soother. So we need to let them have that so that they can calm themselves down, soothe themselves. When teaching sex education and contraceptives for adolescents, what should the nurse consider? I mean, many of us want to say, yeah, abstinence is the best thing. But, you know, adolescents are going to do what they want. So what we have to do is give them what is out there facts as an oral and written stuff. And then they can make the decision what they are going to consider to use. The monthly immunization for RSV is called what? And it's called Synergist. And remember, it's given from fall to early spring. It's for those immune compromised children, those premature children, cardiac, cystic fibrosis, anything with immunosuppressed, they're going to be given it to prevent them from getting the RSV because it could really cause more harm than a normal healthy child. An infant with hypoplastic left heart syndrome is becoming tachypnic. Taking longer to eat requires rest. What assessment is priority? What do you think is going on? What should you give uh, the doctor's information? Because they're going to ask you, so what's going on here? What do you think? Well, remember, hypoplastic left heart, you've got a heart congenitally that doesn't work the way it should. And when you see this, they're getting tired out and they're breathing fast. Something's going on with their lungs, tachypnic. They're breathing a lot. So they're probably going to congestive heart failure. So that's what you would do. Now, are you going to weigh them? Yeah, that's actually a good thing. But number one priority, listen to their lungs. When doing an admission on an infant with a low-grade fever and a loose cough, what information is priority for placement, you got to put them in a room somewhere. I mean, not every hospital has private rooms for every child. So you got to figure out how do you put them somewhere? And the other thing is you can't assume that a cough and a fever is just an, a viral upper respiratory. It could be pertussis. So immunization status is important, and then you know where you could place that child safely to protect the other child. When administering an antibiotic for a child with pharyngitis, what should you monitor? 
I mean, just in general, you're giving antibiotics to a child for whatever the reason. I mean, what is your biggest concern always? I mean, what are you going to teach the parents about antibiotics? You're going to make sure there is not an allergic reaction. Now, if you're in the hospital, pharyngitis usually go home with. If you're in the hospital and doing daily CBCs, yeah, you're going to monitor the, the WBCs, uh, the white count, for sure. And it's coming down. We know the antibiotic is working. By teaching a parent of a newly diagnosed child with acute lymphocytic leukemia, what are early signs and symptoms of an infection? Now, one of the things that we teach our parents on any immunosuppressed child, if they get a fever of 100.5, they need to call their physician because immunosuppressed, they don't have a backup. There's no immune system that can really fight anything. So they need to be probably placed on some sort of antibiotic. That's for sickle cell, for cystic fibrosis, any of them, any immunosuppressed disease. A three-year-old is brought to the ER with increased wheezing for the last two days and the child uses an MDI. What information do you really need to know? What's the most important? You know, a three-year-old child is at that age is, can they really use that MDI, right? I mean, it's hard to chew gum and walk for some people, right? Well, take, put an MDI and breathe in. Many children can't do that. There's many adults who can't. So asking, are they using a spacer? Because many times they're not getting the medicine. So what would the nurse do? Go get a spacer, tell the physician, and he'll say, try it. And most likely you're going to see that wheezing decrease. A multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? Remember, cystic fibrosis has two things that we're looking at. So we have lungs that are full of secretions, so aggressive physiotherapy. Also, nutritionally, they're not getting all the fat that they need. Uh, so we're giving them pancreatic enzymes with every meal or snack immediately before, and to keep their nutrition up, we're gonna give them high protein. Now, how do we test for cystic fibrosis? We do a sweat test, and what are we looking for? We're looking for sodium and chloride. They're losing salt like crazy, so we would never put them on low sodium. Give them a salt shaker, they need to use it. Which information is most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? What causes it? <clears throat> so rheumatic fever is all about strep that was not treated or undertreated. They stopped the antibiotics when they were better. And it can attack the whole body, including the heart and some of the valves. And I mean, it gets to the point where they're even um, not walking great. And when we give this the medicine, antibiotics will cure that strep, but everything will go away except for that heart valve. That will always be damaged and need to have surgery if we don't catch this quick enough. A multi. What are some assessments that an infant would have if they were in acute respiratory distress? An infant.
What's very, very um, great for infants is this grunting. This nasal uh, flaring, these little nose will go in and out, in and out when they breathe. And at the end of a respiration, you hear, uh, uh, uh. and when you hear that grunting, you better be prepared because that child's about to have respiratory collapse and might need to be intubated. You would be tipnic and your respiratory rate would be well above 60. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with a patent ductus arteriosus? Now, when you think of PDA, think of prostaglandins and think of indomethacin. These are the two things and you need to know what they both do. So make sure you're refreshed before the HESI about it. So what duct open? That's that fetal circulation. Mom secretes something called prostaglandins and it keeps that duct open. And once you're, the baby's born, mommy's not there anymore. So they're not getting that prostaglandins. Well, sometimes it doesn't close the way it should or it quick as it should. So we give indomethacin, which says whatever prostaglandin is in there, stop, you're not gonna work and it closes the duct. And we know it's closed when the murmur goes away. How do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? So you tell them, you talk to them, you open up like, you know, you see them listening to music. What sort of music do you like? Or you see them in a cool pair of sneakers or something, you know, what do you like to do for fun? So you're opening the, you know, picking the ice with that. Once you do that, that um, adolescent's going to feel a lot better about you and they will start talking to you about their social life and what's going on. What is the greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization? Remember any newborn with any sort of condition that we suspect and we see something in the echocardiogram, they will be scheduled for a cardiac catheterization. What do we worry about the most? What's the first thing I'm gonna check when I get them back? And that's that they're bleeding. Now, they go into the right femoral artery and vein. And it's a big catheter. And once it's the catheters are pulled out, they hold pressure there to stop it and clot it. But they have to come from the cardiac cath room back to their room, you know, in the cardiac intensive care usually, right? Well, sometimes that jostling and bumping can get that clot, you know, come off. And they can bleed out very quickly. So number one, you're going to check that insertion site, that catheter site. That's how they can, it's the biggest risk for them. Nothing else, it's the bleeding. Which symptoms exhibited by a three-year-old child with croup is priority concern? Well, what is croup? Tracheolaryngeal bronchitis. That means all upper airway is all swollen. And if it gets to the point where they can't swallow, you are in trouble. And most likely it's going to turn into epiglottitis because croup not treated um, soon will, if they let it go on and on, will turn into epiglottitis. This barking cough worse at night, that's bronchitis. Child goes to the ER with respiratory distress. They're anxious, bleeding forward, and drooling. What action is priority? Well, what is that? What do you think it is? They're leaning forward, they're drooling. They can't swallow secretions. This is your epiglottitis. So, this child can't breathe. The epiglottis has covered the trachea. 
it's not allowing air to go in. And usually bending over, not swallowing, not talking or anything, they can get a little bit of air in. But if it gets to the point where it's totally occluded, they either need to be intubated or they need to put a tracheostomy in as an emergency. Those things must be at the bedside in case the doctor needs them now. A 10-month-old status post VSD repairs receiving morning meds. The blood pressure, uh, heart rate 99, uh, 88, respiratory 22. What medication should the nurse question? The heart rate is 88. I think that's the thing that stands out to me. Blood pressure, pretty normal. And that's all about digoxin. Remember when you look at questions with digoxin, think about what you have to look at. You have to look at heart rate, you have to look at dig levels, potassium levels, and vomiting. Now, remember, infants can't tell you they see these yellow halos or something. That's older children, but they that vomiting and those other symptoms, I would question that, and the answer to those questions is always the digoxin. While assessing a newborn infant, you notice decreased femoral pulses bilaterally. What nurse action should we do next? What could that be? They don't have pulses in the feet. The femoral pulses are even really decreased. What do you think that is? Probably coarctation of the aorta. And how do we determine that? And we tell the physician, well, the lower extremities will have a decreased blood pressure, decreased blood flow. And the upper extremities will have a higher, usually the difference of at least 20 millimeters of mercury. And that's the initial thing that we do. Then they go off and do the echocardiogram and they'll go to cardiac cath. A multi. When educating adolescents about the risk for HIV and hepatitis, what would you include? Well, when we're worried about adolescents, number one, we can say abstinence, but you know, they're going to do what they want, of course. Condoms, absolutely, we should recommend. And hand washing, as simple as it sounds, that can help. What discharge teaching would be needed for a toddler diagnosed with hemophilia? So toddlers, ages one to three, what do we know about hemophilia? It's factor eight, factor nine, von Willebrand's. And what is it? It's bleeding. So toddlers tend to be clumsy, right? So we have to safety is the big thing. So pad the size of furniture, get sharp things away from them. They can't bump into, because if they bleed, they're gonna need a factor because they're not gonna stop bleeding. A multi. A child with hemophilia has fallen. The knee is swollen and painful. Treatment would include what? Remember with hemophilia, our goal is to protect joints so that they don't become crippled as they get older because blood can really deteriorate the joint sac. And that happens, then these children will not be able to walk at all. So it's rice. It's um, rest, ice, contain, and elevate. Um, the hot packs will make it bleed more, so cold. We're not going to do anything to increase circulation, so no exercise. So ACE bandage, rest it, ice it, and elevate it. And then possibly they're going to give some home treatment, the home um, factor. They can give it at home. Discharge teaching for a child with cystic fibrosis about respiratory secretion should include what?
So it's all about chest PT, percussion, postural drainage. You know, they've got these wonderful little vibrating vests now that work, um, but we got to keep those lungs moving. It's thick. And if we don't keep it moving, coming out, it will consolidate. It's like a big Petri dish of germs. Your job with leukemia has had recent lab results and the platelet count is 10,000. What is your action? Now, let's just take away child with leukemia. Any child, any adult with low platelets, what are you going to worry about? What do platelets do? And this is platelets are all about bleeding also. Remember, idiopathic uh, cytopenia purpura, ITP, which is platelet counts, which can cause bleeding. Nosebleeds is usually how we find it. These must be placed on bleeding precautions. No IM injections. We'll be monitoring those CBCs, right? We'll be soft toothbrushes, no razor, all of those things. A child starts with a nosebleed for no reason. What action should you do first? So number one, we're gonna take our finger and thumb, sit them forward and pinch it for 10 minutes. If it's still bleeding, they need to seek medical care. An eight-year-old semi-conscious boy is brought to the ER, blood sugar is greater than 600, potassium 6.8714. What are you gonna do first? What's the first thing you do? Well, number one, what is that? Blood sugar is elevated with a low pH. That is diabetic ketoacidosis. What do we have to do first? Well, we need to dilate that sugar, right? It's hemoconcentrated, bolus of fluid. That's number one. And hang up a slow, continuous infusion of regular insulin because regular insulin is the only one that could be given IV. A child submitted with hypoparathyroidism. What findings would you see that needs to be reported to the healthcare provider? Well, what does the parathyroid do? What does it regulate in the body? And it has nothing to do with thyroid hormones, okay? So parathyroid's all about calcium. And when you think about questions, calcium, calcium, magnesium, both, you think of muscles, okay? So if it's not enough, they're weak. Too much, it's going to be more like a tetany. It's going to be tense and tight and spasming, okay? So calcium, think about muscles always. And the parathyroid's only about thy, uh, calcium regulation. So a two and a half year old child status post epispadius repair wants to play. What would be appropriate? What's an epispadius repair? Hypospadius, epispadius, all boys. It's when the urethra doesn't come out to the tip of the penis. It's either underneath or on top. Epispadius is on top. And remember, it's they splay the penis open and they do the surgery. They use the foreskin as part of plastic closure and they put a catheter in there. We don't want anything to hurt that catheter or that penis. So let them sit and put a puzzle together. They're not going to do anything that can hurt that area. A child who has Kuzmal's respirations due to DKA, the increased respiratory rates trying to compensate for what acid base alteration? What do you see with DKA? Diabetic ketoacidosis. Well, that's your first hint is the acidosis. But what is DKA? And it's metabolic acidosis. Now, that respiration, those Kuzmol are deep and prolonged. And actually, it tries to make respiratory alkalosis 
trying to compensate the metabolic. I want you to know that Hanskies usually have four acid-base questions on them. So please review these before you go to your HESI. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? So we know we need to get the parents out of the room. We need to start opening up conversation by asking about their social, what they like to do, and then give them the opportunity to express their feelings open and honestly, and be prepared for some things that these students, these, these adolescents might say. They're trying to shock you, some of them. So be prepared. In the school age conflict of industry versus inferiority, what does industry mean? I said it earlier, what is industry? <clears throat> Remember industry is what they do well whether it's math, whether it's sports, whether whatever it is, they do it well. Inferiority, they can't, because kids want to do everything well, and they can't. It's just human. A multi. A child with a rash, fever, joint inflammation, has rheumatic fever. Teaching should include what? So rheumatic fever can cause heart valve damage. It is caused by a strep infection. It, it will not be improved that heart valve, once it has damage, the antibiotics are not gonna help. But it is long-term antibiotics. It could be a month, two months, it could be three months, it all depends. So that would be your answers. Contraindication to administering the varicella vaccine to an adolescent or anybody. So when we're talking varicella vaccine, it's a live vaccine. Any person who's immunosuppressed shouldn't get it. Now, if you're on steroids, you are immunosuppressed. Any person, child, adult, baby, don't matter. If they're on steroids, they should not get the varicella vaccine. It's live. That's the contraindication. Early detection of a hearing impairment is critical. Which one is of primary importance? Hearing goes hand in hand with what? Hearing has everything to do with speech. So if you can't hear, the speech is gonna be garbled. And sometimes that, that is the symptom that they'll go get hearing tests. And helping a child to adapt to a hospitalization experience, the best approach is what? What's the number one thing that's the important? You could say many of these things. The best. <clears throat> it's all about routine routine. Yeah, you can bring in the toys, you can bring in the food, but the routine, bath time, uh, even getting the food similar if the diet allows it, this will make a child feel more secure. When assessing vision on a child, the healthcare provider would use a snelling chart at what distance?
and it's 20 feet. And if they're not seeing anything, this is when you need to notify the physician because the child's having some sort of vision problem and probably needs uh, glasses at least. Referrals for cognitive impairment should occur when child's not turning over, child's not using fine motor skills, the child's not verbalizing the way they should. This is all thinking and doing. You know, and the beauty of children, you're going to see delays, but you start intervention. I always say early, early intervention. As quick as you can start it, kids catch up quickly. That's why I love them so much, because you can catch them up, and they are so willing to learn and please. I would encourage a preschooler to be less apprehensive when taking their vital signs. You know, that preschooler ages three to five, they're very suspicious of strangers. So how would you get things done? You know, they think that thermometer is going to stick them, right? You want to put it underneath their arm. Well, let them play with it. Let them push the buttons. Let them do whatever they need to do in order not to be afraid of the equipment and make it more of a game. What acid, base, and balance might you see with a child having profuse diarrhea? Well, what do you need to know about diarrhea and what is lost? Well, diarrhea stool has all the enzymes from digestion of food and they're all alkaline. So you're losing alkaline like crazy. So you're only left with metabolic acidosis, okay? Because you get rid of all the alkaline. I mean, you're always worried about the loss of fluid would be hypokalemia. Now, what if you're vomiting? Well, what acid base? Well, stomach acid. You're losing acid. What are you left with? Then it's metabolic alkalosis. Those are a couple of your acid base questions that you are going to see. A parent calls because her child is exposed to a child that now has chicken pox. When are you contagious for chicken pox? No, yes, we do have the vaccine, right? It doesn't mean that you're not going to get chicken pox. Some people still do, okay? That's a misnomer. I mean, it decreases your chances that, but you still can. And it's two days before the rash appears and until all the lesions are dry and crusted, that's when they are contagious. When we see a child with these rashes that look like it, they're oozy and juicy things with fever, these children are placed in respiratory isolation because it's droplet, it's in the air. And they're put in those reverse rooms where the flow goes out to the air, not into the hospital. We treat them very seriously. What is the nursing priority preoperatively intervention for a child with Wilms tumor? Well, that's a kidney tumor. It's on African-American boys ages three to five. That's the big, you know, where you see them get this tumor. And I told my students, I've seen it once. Now, it's an encapsulated tumor, and it can metastasize on manipulation. So do not touch that abdomen. Leave it alone. And this is a tumor that they will not do a biopsy before they do surgery. They might do radiation. They might do chemo. But they will not do a biopsy because that will make the metastasis go into the peritoneal cavity. A multi. If an infant is not past the meconium stool in the first 24 to 36 hours, what would you assess for? There's several things. Well, Hirschsprung's megacolon, that's a bowel obstruction. Cystic fibrosis and hypothyroidism, they'll be checking for it. 
I mean, not passing a stool really is not going to look at electrolytes. A child with sickle cell disease would most likely exhibit what signs and symptoms of a crisis? And it's pain. I mean, sickle cell is pain and the pain is caused because the cells get stuck when a vessel bifurcates, it gets stuck. All the cells go behind it, it swells and it causes pain. And our first line of treatment, let's get those vessels bigger so we can open up that dam. So it's fluids, bolus fluids. When teaching the child and family about celiac disease, which of these food items are allowed? or is allowed. Rice, rice is the one. Wheat, rye, barley, oats, it's not allowed. It will cause severe pain in the child. Rice they can have, rice flour stuff they can have. A child, an old boy playing outside. What action should the nurse do first? First of all, we're going to clean that uh, wound, whatever it is. Soap and water. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Put antibiotic ointment. Then the physician will do that tetanus booster. Sometimes even like with animal bites, we'll even inject it around the bites and then give a booster. So it depends on the injury. A six-year-old goes to the ER due to abdominal pain, fever, vomiting. What assessment is priority? What are you going to ask? What do you need to know besides all of that? I mean, is this just vomiting or is this something else, right? And the only way to know that is to say, tell me where's the abdominal pain? What if it's right lower quadrant? Well, now you know it's an appendix. Is it at the belly button? That could just be a GI. Very important, where is the pain? A five-year-old child fell from a monkey bars and is crying because of the pain in her arm. What action by the nurse should you do first? What's the most important thing we need to assess? Got a broken arm, most likely. And we're gonna check capillary refill. Is blood still flowing around there? That is the most important thing. Very good. What is one way to keep de uh, help detect hypo or hyperthyroidism in children? What does the thyroid hormone do for children? We know it's for cognition, especially when they're newborns. We want them, if they're showing they're not having bowels and it's uh, thyroid. We want to start that hormone as soon as we can. Very important. They need it. But why do we do height and weight every visit? Part of it has to do with growth hormones and thyroid. You need thyroid hormone to grow properly. Very good. What would be the most important to report to a healthcare provider regarding eight-year-old status post appendectomy? with NG tube to suction, what is important here? Now, I've given you this whole thing, this whole situation, but which one of those down there is the number one patient you're gonna go see because they are the most dangerous or at risk. And that's that neutrophil count. Neutrophil count should be above 2000. If they're at 400, they have no immune system especially if you get a question that says, has a fever with a neutrophil count of four or 500. That is your priority patient to see. They can go into septic shock very quickly. A multi status post, signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis. 
very common in children, three weeks to three months. And I want to know about number one, are they vomiting here, little dribbles, or across the room? Let's aim it somewhere. And of course, that olive sized mass. If this parent tells me they're vomiting forcefully, projectile, my hand's going to go up underneath, uh, above, below the xiphoid process. And I will see that little olive mass, that little marble feeling thing. They are there. Make the child NPO, and that child's going to go for ultrasound, and they need IV fluids. A multi. A child with chronic kidney disease has renal osteodystrophy. What outcomes would you see if a child has osteodystrophy? What does that word mean? Pull it apart. You're gonna see problems with the bone. It could be slow growth. Um, you're gonna see also these low uh, levels of vitamin D, which do need replacement. You could have you know, misshaped bones, shorter bones. Very important that we monitor that. We want children to grow up to be as normal as they can. You suspect an infant has cryptoorchidism. How would you examine this infant? You know, yesterday I went into this uh, cold water springs and I think the temperature in the water was 60 something. And I was teasing my son about cryptoorchidism and how the cold sucks them up and how if it was warm that they just uh, relax. So the testicles, you can feel the testicles. So warm room, very important. A multi. What teachings would you give parents on how a hydrospedius is corrected? We're coming up on 5.30. If you want to stay, I'm going to stay with you. If you need to go, I understand. Hypospadius, that means the opening is on the bottom of the penis, not on the end. And we usually do it before they're potty trained. And we're gonna put that little catheter there. And we, we do nothing with that catheter. We just keep it under a diaper so it doesn't leak somewhere out. So we can monitor that urine output. A multi. Child with nephrotic syndrome are often given albumin and Lasix for fluid overload. What outcomes do you want? What would you see? Remember nephrotic syndrome is not, which is not, Kidney failure. It's the kidney saying, ooh, protein, I don't like you. i getting rid of you. The other word for protein is albumin. So we replace the protein. We give Lasix, and you should see fluid come out like crazy. So you're going to see increased urine output, reduction of the edema, and less fluid, the blood pressure is going to come down. It has nothing to do with fever. It's all about putting the protein back in the cells, pulling the interstitial fluids back into the intravascular and then getting rid of it with the Lasix. What lab value on one of your clients make them a priority to see? If you listened earlier, you know this answer. I mean, all those values are pretty off the wall, right? They're nothing normal here. Which one's the priority? And that's your neutrophil count. That neutrophil count of 500, there's no immune system. They are apt to get septic shock if we don't monitor them quickly. Yeah, white cells up, they're infected, potassium, okay. It may be cardiac dysrhythmias and glucose that needs to be covered, but that neutrophil count is the priority there. A multi. An adolescent with a BMI of 90% is complaining of frequent urination. What tests can you anticipate the healthcare provider doing? I mean, adolescents, this is overweight for sure. Okay. They say obese at 95, but 90 is pretty close.
So we're going to do a urine. Let's just see if there's any infection. Of course, electrolytes, you're going to be losing potassium, but this could be the beginning of diabetes, hemoglobin A1C. And you would want to see that level less than seven on a pediatric person. But what teaching should be done for an adolescent with Hodgkin's lymphoma getting chemo and radiation? What do they need to know? Remember Hodgkin's lymphoma is all up above. It's all about the lymph nodes, big and painless, right? And the big thing about doing the chemo or doing the radiation, they are at risk for infertility and it's something they should be aware about. A child falls in a thick bush. She's covered by prickers and complains of severe eye pain. Intervention. So when we worry about eyes and something's in there, if we see it, we can just take, and it's moving, we can take a tissue and get it out. If it's stuck in there, cover both eyes with these Fox shields, it's called, and get them to ophthalmology or get them to pediatric ER so they can uh, take care of it and save the eye. A two-year-old goes to the ER, inconsolable crying in a painful abdomen. What finding shows you that this is a medical emergency? You know, when you get two-year-olds, and this is the age that you see this a lot, you can't console these kids no matter what you do. And you, their arms and their legs are just, especially their legs are like, ouch, and they're hurting and they're crying. Now, this is interception. Interception, what do you see? Well, those symptoms plus current jelly stool. So I would open the diaper or the underwear and you might see a little bit of like gooey jelly with maybe a little bit of blood uh, streaks in it. You know that's a deception. Diagnose it with a, a ultrasound and then it's either an air embolus or surgery for the treatment for it. Which, when assessing a two month old with vomiting, what questions should you ask the parent? What did I tell you about vomiting when I was talking about projectile vomiting? I mean, many parents come in with young children saying the child's vomiting. Number one question I'm going to ask, tell me about that vomiting. Is it dribbling, which is reflux, GERD, or is it across the room? And it's across the room that I know it is a projectile, which is by large stenosis. You notice a two-year-old child with congenital heart disease, a heart rate's decreasing. What other information do you need to tell the doctor about this? Remember congenital heart disease, you got a heart that's weak and sometimes they give up. Now, two-year-old with a blood pressure of 68 over 44 is very low and they probably need some sort of medication for support and it is dangerous. Their hearts will give up. What priority procedure will you anticipate for a child suspected of having Kawasaki disease? Well, what is Kawasaki disease and what do we worry about the most? You know, it's systemic vasculitis. That's the, the global name for it. But what are we concerned about the most? And the answer is we're worried about an aneurysm on the coronary artery. So an echocardiogram definitely is going to be the first thing they want to do for that child. A multi. Why do we give aspirin therapy to a child diagnosed with Kawasaki disease? Remember I said a vascular itis, right? What is an itis? Sometimes you got to look at diagnosis, understand what it is, and say, okay, there's a vascular inflammation. 
micro uh, clots could be formed. So you want to decrease the inflammation because aspirin is an NSAID and prevent clots. Homoptai. What lab test should be monitored for a child with congenital hypothyroidism? Well, which one of these are all about the thyroid gland? And the answer is T3, T4, TSH. That's what it is. Growth hormones, pituitary. A multi. When entering the room of a child, the child becomes stiff. The arms and legs start shaking. What is your priority action? What do you need to do? Like, what is going on here? I mean, part of the exam, right? So we take them, we turn them to the side to prevent aspirations, remove sharp stuff from the bed pad, the side rails if we need to, put the head rail down. Never, ever let the parent leave. Don't ever do that to a, a parent. And then notify the uh, response team. And of course, we're going to document. A three-year-old boy with waddling gait and is falling is admitting for testing. What procedure would you anticipate three-year-old boy waddling and is falling? That's muscular weakness. What do you know about weakness of muscles? What diagnosis have we talked about? And then how do we document that that's what it is? And it's all about testing the muscles with the electromyography. Remember, these are little sharp, little electrical currents. And when they're done, it's like they've worked out in the gym all day and their muscles are going to hurt. So warm the parents, warm them, and make sure they get something for pain afterwards, Tylenol or Motrin. And mother calls the clinic about her child. She's playing in the woods and has a rash that is spreading. What over-the-counter stuff can I give my kid? What's good? She's playing in the woods, has a rash, and it's, it's starting to spread. What do you think's going on here? <clears throat> this is a child that should seek medical attention. The key words here is the rash is spreading. This could get to the point of anaphylaxis, okay? So we're not going to recommend giving them an over-the-counter. The mother calls the clinic and a friend of her child has ticks from playing in a field. What do you tell the mother to do? How do we treat ticks? And what do ticks cause? So, what we tell the mother, just check the child. Do you see anything anywhere? And if you do, pull them out. If you can't get them out, they need to go to a physician for them to do it for you. What shouldn't you do to a child diagnosed with empentago? Really bad skin staph infection. You know, my grandson had it. It was the back of his leg. And his mother thought he had scratched too much when he was sleeping. But it kept spreading. And of course, it came into my house and it was this oh, oozy, juicy, painful thing. So the one thing that you shouldn't do is open the wounds because that's how it spreads, okay? It's oral antibiotics and topical, both. And it's not just triple antibiotic ointment. It's that um, munosuprin or the Bactroban, which is prescription. They need strong stuff for that. An adolescent goes to the school nurse complaining of ringing in her ears. What exam should you do first? Well, the first thing you need to do is look, see if there's something in the ears. You know, I've seen roaches, cockroaches in the ears. So that could be something that you 
could hear ringing. So always check the obvious, look inside first and then go further. A multi. An infant is being discharged after 14 days of uh, vancomycin. What teaching should be included? Well, what do you know about vancomycin? Well, we know it's an amino glucoside. We know we have to do peaks and troughs. What else do we know? Side effects, think about. We need to worry about the kidneys because it causes kidney failure, so wet diapers. And it's also ototoxic. We need to look at the hearing. The other stuff, the, the levels, they're already past that. We're just worried about the side effects that it could have caused. And last question, guys, a multi. When checking the lab values for a child with hypothyroidism, what lab values would you look at? Well, we did it before, we'll give it to you again. <clears throat> and that's TSH, T4, and T3. Good job, guys. Thank you for hanging on. Number three is Akela. Number two, Alyssa, good job, guys. Number one, Amanda, number four, APA, I love APA, and Hope. So that is your cahoots for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if I will be sending these recordings to both Professor Morris's class and to my class as soon as I get them downloaded. It's a little bit longer, so it'll take me a little bit of time, but you will get them tonight. So remember, Sunday, 2 p.m., I'm doing the question answer. And when I post this recording, I'm going to post the PowerPoint that's going to go on with it and the details um, on Sunday and my um, Zoom link, et cetera. Okay? Thank you, guys. You're going to do well. Professor Bogart, is yes. that 2 p.m. Central or Eastern?